Maya. <laughs> like karma, you could talk about that for 20 years and never really get to the bottom of it. Um, simply because it's one of those things that language is not really equipped to deal with. Um, I mentioned that it's something of an illusion, and it's seductive, um, but there's no actual attempt to seduce us. Whatever seductiveness Maya has is a function of our own desires. Uh, we want the will, you know, Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, among others, Frankel. We want. We want something. That is sort of part of the seduction, because we want something, and that which is what we want is out there, if we want. So, we look out into the phenomenal universe, which is there. <laughs> I'm not... It, it, Maya says... Maya sort of implies illusion, but even that is a tricky word, calling it an illusion, because there's in many ways you could use the word illusion. Illusion mean, being that it's just not there, uh, and we see something that simply isn't there, and that's not Maya. Maya does not necessarily deny that the universe is out there. The Hindus would call it prakriti, um, just the phenomenal universe, <laughs> uh, matter, whatever. <clears throat> but it doesn't necessarily say that it is there in the way that we perceive it. I perceive things in a way that my senses are equipped to relay the information to my brain or to my consciousness or whatever you want to call it. My senses draw a map of reality, but it's not the reality itself. The map that I build or that is constructed by my desire simultaneous with my interaction with the universe, which is there, is what creates Maya. I want to see something out there. That's what makes Maya, that's what makes the universe seductive. And the fact that my desires create that which I see in many ways, and my senses paint a picture that my mind receives um, based upon what my mind expects to see. My mind is only um, capable of reading maps that I understand. My senses create maps of reality for me that I can understand. It's when I mistake that map for what's actually there that Maya takes place. One, when you say things like illusion, or when you say that Maya is illusion, or when you say that the universe is dualistic and that there's, you know, mind and then everything else, <clears throat> that doesn't necessarily tell the whole story of Maya, because Maya is not a solipsistic concept in any way at all. In fact, I would say that it's exactly the opposite. It's how to avoid solipsistic um, snares, but again, you, again, Maya being Maya, the more snares you overcome or the more illusions you dispel, the more seem to just appear. And that's okay. It, it's assumed that that's going to happen. Um, you just got to get, you've got to get used to that fact that, you know, it, the, that reality is in many ways an endless room of distorting mirrors. That's okay. It's not, that doesn't mean that reality isn't out there. What Maya is, is the idea, the misperception, that your perceptions are reality itself. It's not that we're not seeing, or it's not that we're seeing something that isn't there. We're seeing a version of what is there, which is essentially conjured into existence by our own desires. Yes, the universe is there. Yes, phenomenality is there. Um, the... Um, the system of Hindu thought that I, I won't say I've subscribed to, but the one that sort of meshes best with my way of thinking, 
is dualistic in that there is the assumption that mind and matter are two different things. A lot of traditions uh, or systems of thinking hold this. Um, again, it's one of those debates I think that you can only really take sides on. I don't think it'll ever be conclusively solved, but be that as it may. You look out into the universe or you receive perceptions from the universe, they're always going to be tainted by what you expect to see, what you fear to be the case, what you want to be the case, whatever. It's either desire or it's opposite, aversion. One of those two is at play whenever you perceive anything. That's all right. And in, in, in fact, as I mentioned in the previous video, it probably couldn't be otherwise. But the main thing is to be conscious that this is happening. It's not solipsism, and it's not hard materialism either. It's a fascinating blending of the two, if you ask me. Um, it's a difficult thing. As I say, it, it, you end up in something resembling infinite regression when you deal with Maya. But even the infinite regression is all right, as long as you see it for what it is. What Maya essentially does is it teaches you, or what studying Maya, I guess, essentially, or using the concept of Maya, teaches you to do, is not so much mistrust your senses or your perceptions, but to be wary of those perceptions themselves. Um... It's not so much that our perceptions are wrong, it's just that they're biased. And it's the bias that manifests itself as Maya. It manifests itself as a function of our own desires or various modalities of desire, um, aversion and desire, attraction and repulsion, that kind of thing. Um, as you can see, I'm kind of stumbling for words here, but that's, again, that's all right. That's kind of built into the whole idea of Maya. Um, to me, at least, Maya is almost inextricable from Anekantavada. Or, to put it more atheistically, Nietzsche's perspectivism. Um, if I take any object, I've just got this little tin can that normally contains tea, <laughs> um, is there a correct way for me to view this, a, a right angle for me to see this for what it actually is, this tin can? No, there isn't, but that doesn't mean that the tin can isn't there. I've got it in my hand. Is there a correct way for me to perceive this? No, but if I just decide that this is what I see it is and all, all of the biases that my senses have um, that kick in whenever I perceive this thing. If I decide that all the biases are real, then Maya is now taking place. To deal with Maya, you don't... My experience has been you don't actually just want to dispel it in as much as you want to understand it. You want to understand what's happening. You want to understand what is taking place. So you have to understand that the way you're looking at things or the way you're perceiving something might not be the only way to perceive them or perceive it. There might be an infinite number of ways to perceive a thing and even thingness itself has an infinite number of ways to perceive it. It doesn't mean that that thing or that reality itself isn't there. <laughs> um, tough one, isn't it? <clears throat> We know that the universe is made up of matter, energy, empty space, yada, 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 functions of each other, yes. We have gigantic disagreements with each other as to what actually is going on. It seems never-ending. That, too, is part of Maya. Um, and Anikantavada is the sort of thing that allows you to grapple with Maya, to say that, okay, it's there, but there's no one way to perceive it. Um, perspectivism, same idea. There is no right and wrong way to perceive reality. But reality is still there. It's not blotting reality out, and it's not saying that the whole thing is just cooked up
by our own minds and we're a brain in a vat. No, it's not saying that at all. What it's what Maya, coupled with Anekandivada, uh, or even I should say Syadvada, which is the sevenfold theory of maybe that we get from the Jains, it says maybe it is, maybe you are seeing it right, but maybe you're not seeing it right. And maybe you can't really describe it to somebody else in the same way that you understand it. That's okay. It's still there. It's still there. But we fundamentally disagree. And we're, in the very nature of things, we can't not disagree on what it is because of the limited nature of our perceptive apparatus. Our apparatus for perceiving everything. It is not complete our perceptive apparatus is not complete. It's not equipped to see everything from every possible angle. Cubist art has always fascinated me for that reason. Now, cubism is kind of passe these days, but I like it. And it, I like a quote from Pablo Picasso, where he said, and I've mentioned this quote several times before, to, to paint cubistically, you don't paint what you see, you paint what you know is there. <laughs> In, that's why you get these weird disjointed images of mundane objects seen from every conceivable angle. If I was any good, I'd do a cubist painting of this and show you um, what Maya or Anikantavada, in sort of uh, concert with each other, can produce in the way of a perception of that tin can. Um, but we've all seen cubist paintings and the, the crazy sort of angles in everything, and um, those of us who have actually taken the time to try and figure out what they were trying to do with cubism can see that there is a powerfully sort of intellectual uh, streak in it. It's, um, it. it's just an attempt to to portray what is actually there in a way that our senses are not equipped. And visually only, of course. Um, cubism is just sort of a very narrowly uh, explored version of perspectivism or Anakantavada or even Maya. The blind man and the elephant is basically the, the easy version of Anakantavada and Maya. Seven blind men, one elephant. Each blind man feels a part of the elephant and says, that's the elephant. One guy feels the trunk and he says the elephant is like a big snake. The next person feels one of his ears and he says the elephant is like a big palm leaf. Another one feels its leg and he says the elephant is like a big tree trunk, etc., etc. Each one of them is right and each one of them is wrong. And Maya is acting on all of them. Their blindness the limitations of their senses. This is going to require several more videos, I think.